Kyrie Irving. 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 Kyrie. It's what the news in the basketball world was spewing out for the past several days in mid-June. And it did nothing but serve its purpose. Keep people talking. When I spoke to Mike Greenberg, one of the main sportscasters for ESPN. <coughs> oh, that's a plug. Oh my gosh, check out the other channel, the second channel, on the link in the description to go see that video. He said that the number one priority for sports networks is to keep people talking. That's why Kendrick Perkins and Paul Pierce haven't been fired, in fact, just the opposite. They've been promoted in multiple instances. You've got Perkins on The Jump, one of the most decorated shows in ESPN, and you've got Paul Pierce on national television often. And it's because they're excellent discussion generators. Most talking heads don't have the luxury of name recognition like Perk and Paul Pierce do. You see, when they say something wild or out of pocket, they're taken a lot more seriously than some random person who had to go up the ranks. Basically, you know their history and name, so there's a lot more of a reaction. I mean, the only reason that people still remember about the 2008 championship is because their members keep talking about it. For example, who won the championship in 2007? Yeah, it was definitely the Spurs. But it took you a longer time to remember that than it would for the Celtics, at least in most cases, because they talk about it. There's a reason Tony Parker and Tim Duncan aren't in today's news system. But I digress. When Kyrie Irving made the quote unquote bad statement that it's bad optics for black players to be playing for white bosses in a time like this, it was instantly taken out of context. Left and right, you can see points being created and not analyzed like, Oh, it's Kyrie. He's not a leader. He's not even a contender. Oh, he doesn't want LeBron to get his chip. Uh, he's ruining it again for everyone. You don't need to sit out to be an activist. Why should we believe a flat earther? Kyrie's the dumb person's idea of a smart person. And more. Sports discussions are often out of context because the audience doesn't take the full time to make a conclusion. It's one of the most dangerous things that the age of social media news has brought to the public. And the real story always ends up twisted in some way. We don't know what was said in that meeting. All that we have are these few quotes that are provided to us. There's a reason why almost a third of NBA players eligible to play in Orlando showed up. Just like there's a reason that Kyrie Irving was selected as one of the vice presidents of the Players Association. They're truly concerned. When the primary voices of an association speak up towards one opinion, you're naturally inclined to believe that they're speaking up for everybody. For example, if the leaders of an industry like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates said that their number one priority was to provide supplies to the lesser fortunate, then you'd be inclined to believe that the other super rich tech people would believe the same things, which I can guarantee you that they're not. A relatively recent example even, if you were to gauge the NBA's affiliation with Donald Trump, you'd say that it's pretty bad, wouldn't you? What with LeBron's tweet, Steph Curry's refusal to go to the White House, and the league's tilt towards promoting social justice and equality, those are all things that come across very anti-Trump. The owners, however, would beg to differ. If you think about it, none of them have denounced Trump in a serious way. Tillman Fertitta, the owner of the Houston Rockets, and James Dolan, the owner of the Knicks, have both issued public donations to Trump's 2020 presidential campaign. So it's things like that, right, that show that the most visible people don't necessarily speak for the entire body. When Harden, Giannis, KD, Curry, and basically the entire top 10 of the league all unanimously supported playing, you're drawn to think that that's how everyone feels. Like, everyone's ready for the competition. They're all willing to take that risk. That's, that's excellent, Cap. <laughs> <laughs> Going against those guys' opinions on that, well, is a tough thing to deal with. You don't want to be that one guy in Bill Gates' company that tells him that he's wrong. And it's doubly dangerous, too, due to the desperation of basketball fans. It's one person versus hundreds of thousands of people that are desperate for basketball. If you're the odd man out as an average player, then you're probably gonna get clowns. Say, for example, that Evan Turner said that he would sit out the season because of the racial climate. What would your reaction be? Be honest. Be honest. And he's the only one to say it, all by himself. I mean, most people would latch onto the notion that, oh, he wants to ruin it for the rest of us, right? Etc. Etc. Or maybe more likely, he'd just be drowned out by the more popular players and simply unconsidered. The message only often carries if the messenger has weight. Whether that be Kendrick Perkins audibly calling Kyrie Irving an idiot on national television. If you take Kyrie Irving's brain and put it in a bird right now, guess what that bird is gonna do? Mm -hmm. It's gonna fly backwards. And, or LeBron saying that the season must resume, or even Patrick Beverly claiming that if LeBron says they're playing, then they're playing. All of these people have relevance in some shape or form and then are based off of their notoriety. For Perkins, it's that he's got a bone to pick with Kyrie, or that he's a sellout. For LeBron, it's that this is his best chance to get a fourth ring. For Beverly, it's just that he's trying to get in the head of LeBron and throw shade and all of that, right? 
for Kyrie, apparently it's that he's jealous of LeBron and taking his power and being a selfish dude and all of that, but through all of that muck, the message was still heard. It's easy to forget that he was indeed the voice of the players on that call. The players that were listed had this notoriety. That's Carmelo, KD, Chris Paul, and Donovan Mitchell. I mean, they're not gonna report that Gary Harris attended the call, you know? The number one team in the league, the Lakers, even had players that stand against the season resuming. During all the chatter around potential of canceling the season, Dwight Howard posted a statement to CNN that became a huge quotable, essentially that basketball isn't needed at the moment. And Avery Bradley, who's been quoted on being a quiet storm throughout this entire process. They haven't been covered as much, obviously, because there's not a tremendous amount of controversy considering those players speaking their mind in some, uh unsavory way. But their concerns are valid. The media is fickle. They only do what gets them the most attention. Sports are an opportunity for the country's public to be united under one conversation. And hey, this is for real life right here. If you want people to be connected, then you want to leave politics all the way out the window. When you're a platform that celebrates togetherness and sports, then you straight up don't want to be polarizing if you want to be popular. So if the season starts, these sports shows, ESPN and Fox and all the others will focus on the games at hand, as opposed to the void that the NBA leaves, which apparently allows space for the next discussion and steps for the Black Lives Matter movement. But more importantly, the pressure is placed upon the operators of the league, that is, the owners and the commissioner, to try their best to follow the words of their players, given that the players are able and willing to sit out the season. A similar thing occurred in 1964, the infamous All-Star Game boycotts, which is a video for another day. But yeah, at the very least, that's the argument for the non-playing faction. Make sure that there's enough space for the movement to be heard and apply pressure to the league administrators to support the cause. But of course, it really can't be that simple. When hearing an argument for the first time, you can either agree or disagree. Now, of course, there's levels to that, but those are your really two options. To agree or disagree right away without any other outside information is wrong most of the time, because it either sounds completely solid and reasonable or completely stupid and dumb. And that's because the reasoning behind it either sounds really good and clever or really stupid and dumb. What I mean by that is if you hear the justification for an argument, what you tend to do is accept those reasons as the only parts of the argument. Or on the flip side, you either come up with reasons to show why those reasons don't work Work. No matter what side you're on, it's very unlikely that everyone's input is included. Which leads us all the way back to the original predicaments. There are players that are ready to play and those who very much aren't. But with Kyrie initially throwing off the NBA circuits, the superstars again are at the forefront of the conversation. That's when it became Kyrie versus LeBron. Basically, if they wanted to play or not. Leaving out the some 300 opinions that come with the rest of the players in the league. Canceling the season would leave the space to protest, right? And the only thing stopping them from playing is the love of competition. Full stop. If you only listen to Kyrie's and Dwight's statements and all the conversation around them, that that's what you're led to believe. Just like I said, it's more complicated than just that. According to one prominent agent with a lot of clients, players aren't only just worried about the social issues at hand, but also the coronavirus, the risk of injury after, you know, not playing for three months and getting back to professional basketball, and also having to be stuck on campus all at once. There are a lot of pressures that are hanging over players in the short term, all of which are very understandable. Many of them aren't household names, and that means simply that they're risking a lot more than anyone else. Like you have Austin Rivers advocating for the season to start so that they can use the money that they'll be earning by playing to donate to black businesses and stuff. Of course, that's a valid use of money, but that's not a make or break situation. Unless you're very new to the league, a question of $400 to donate to charity won't be decided by you being able to keep 15% of your revenue this season. It's just simply not that impactful. What the actual issue is, and the thing a lot of players are scared of, is the ramifications of a shutdown season. If the television networks are met with the possibility that players can cancel the arrangements for a season, then they'll apply their administrative force. In the Collective Bargaining Agreement's 39th chapter concerning the Force Majora Clause, which is basically a fancy way of saying that games can't be played anymore due to certain circumstances, the NBA has the right to terminate the original CBA and negotiate a new one. Of course, the coronavirus doesn't have any reason to reach out the CBA, as it's affecting literally everyone. But if the players decide to sit out the season, thus canceling games, then it's a whole different story. The trust that's between the players, the league, and most importantly, the TV networks would basically be gone, meaning that they won't be sure of how long the players sit out and if they're liable to sit out again for another season in the future. To these executives, there'd be way too many unknowns. 
And in the business world, let me tell you, this is real life. Unknowns are a big, big no-no when it comes to revenue. In order to ensure that their money is safe, they'll renegotiate a new contract, one that's almost definitely going to inflict economic injury upon the players. Now, for the $20 million and up players, in the end, they really won't be that affected. But those on the lower ends with not too much money and families to provide for generations from now, or even those living paycheck to paycheck, they'll most definitely hurt. While they definitely support the causes behind the cancellation, they won't want to place their economic future over a protest that doesn't even have a definitive operation plan. And literally everyone can succumb to this, even LeBron, who not wanting to make bad business with China, declined to say anything about the Hong Kong protests to ensure that his biggest international market wasn't going to completely hate him and thus stop buying his stuff. And this is from a guy that's basically supposed to be a billionaire in a few years. So what about those on $10 million contracts, which is only 4.8 million after taxes anyway? It's in their best interest to scoop up as much money as possible and jeopardizing it in such a vague way is the last of their ideas. Then of course, there's the lack of the platform, an argument made by so many people already. The basic premise is that basketball players don't have a strong platform when they're not playing, well, basketball. Which is true, but not all the way. Basketball players are by far some of the most influential figures on social media scene, and what they say is very often heard. But then there's the audience that doesn't have social media that's been said multiple times as well, but ESPN and Fox Sports and the like have done a good job of following what the pulse of the conversation is. And for the first weeks of June, it was the injustice surrounding George Floyd and the black community. So the people interested in sports without any social media have been decently reached, so that's not that strong of an argument. Regardless or not, if the players talk about injustice in the post-game pressers, the audience that primarily watches TV have been watching First Take or Sports Center or something like that, so they're in the loop. So that's not necessarily effective. Stopping the season is only going to hurt a majority of the players, and there's already been enough awareness revolving around American racial injustice that's driving folks crazy with discomfort, which by the way is good. With the huge problems that the pandemic has brought to this country, sports are the lights at the end of the tunnel and the ultimate unifier. Why cut that off for such a vague reason? Now, that's what everything that's been consumed so far would have you believe. In fact, there's something that Kyrie and the No Play faction have up their sleeve that won't only just unify the players union, but also put them in a position of bargaining power right away. And all it is, is making a demand. Or better yet, a list of demands. Or better even yet, a list of demands that owners would not agree to under normal circumstances. See, right now, the NBA is more liable to damages than even the players are. If the players sat out for the season, it would show that the NBA isn't truly in control of the product that they distribute, and it would cause uneasiness amongst the media companies, the networks that provide the NBA with its revenue. Since the 2021 season won't be held with any fans, a topic coming up soon on this channel, by the way, I'd advise for you to subscribe to check out for that one. The NBA's last wish is to have really their only source of income be suspicious of them. They don't want to terminate the contract as much as the players don't, meaning that they're willing to listen to whatever they say as long as they're in Orlando playing NBA games come July 30th. But not only that, the NBA has also branded itself as a progressive league. If they don't listen to demands that the players issue with racial injustice, then it hurts their optics. They might be seen as a company that only cares about its revenue, something that Adam Silver has worked very hard to deflect and minimize. Something else that he's worked very hard to upkeep is the voices of the players. The NBA is a player's league through and through. Fans care about the players far more than they do about the operation behind it. That's what makes it so fascinating. Mike Greenberg also told me that people don't nearly care as much as the sports as they care about the people. <coughs> really? Check that video out. Go subscribe. So the people that are representatives of the league, the LeBron, the KD, the Giannis, they're who the league wants to please at all costs. Amplified by the pressure of potentially losing the rest of the 2020 season, the opportunity to be the lights of America, and the possible issues that they could have with their only revenue makers next season, then you have a formula that's impossible to beat. As of now, Avery Bradley has spoken about three things that the No Play Coalition will be demanding. Strong efforts to increase diversity in the management office to better reflect the NBA, donations to organizations that deal with the black community community and their struggles, and partnerships with black-owned businesses and vendors at arenas. These definitely aren't going to be the only terms on the demand sheet, and they'll definitely pack more punch when the actual writing comes around. This is a golden opportunity to coerce the league to demands that they'd otherwise be uncomfortable with agreeing to, because it's for the safety of their product. This might mean anything from redecorating the courts to include Black Lives Matter materials, or requiring an African American history segment on one of the television networks, or requiring owners to put out statements and donations to African American communities. All things that most of them would be hesitant to do normally. Adam Silver has already put out a memo to teams that they'll be in solidarity with the black protests. Now it's up to the players to take that statement and push it as far as they can go.
The players, the most valuable assets of a multi-billion dollar corporation, will be the ones to bring change. And when the NBA comes back, it'll be in a way that we haven't ever seen before. And I for one can't wait to see it. Thanks for watching.